Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Well-Rounded Saxophonist, a podcast that aims to provide valuable information to young saxophonists and music students in a digestible amount of time. I'm Owen Robinson, and today I will be interviewing Dr. Nikki Roman, professor of saxophone at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Dr. Roman, it's great to have you on the show today. Thanks for having me, Owen. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. So my first question that I wanted to ask is, what do you think are some of the most important literary resources for young saxophone students? This could include etude books, method books, repertoire, etc. Well, I think what is most important when I'm working with just young musicians in general is kind of breaking down this idea that there is a set prescribed list of resources that students really need to focus on to be successful and successful is a whole other kind of conversation to have about what we define as success but for me what's really important is is breaking down that idea that there's a canon so that we can start to have discussions on new thoughts and ideas and areas of interest and that's where it really gets exciting Um, and i find that my mind is really focused on that a lot in teaching because when I'm working with younger students a lot of times they'll say this is my first saxophone lesson or this is the first time I've really gotten to meet with a professional artist or musician so thinking about ways that I can provide try to to give access to students to have an experience that's enjoyable while they're also gaining something and so in terms of set repertoire, yes, there's a set list of pieces like Glazunov or Ebert. We want to cover areas that are going to target certain things, but I think it's also important for the diversity of our repertoire to introduce things like unconventional notation. And so I found students really thrive in that area or transcribing and learning tunes. Um, so that might mean they don't learn that standard piece of repertoire right away. Maybe there's another path that they might want to take uh, that that can be supplemented in that way that they're still advancing on the instrument and they're really having fun. Um, so that's, that's really important. Um, I also think in terms of literary resources, or in, especially for younger students, sometimes that comes with a price tag. Um, students can't certain students can't always access the same resources that other students can and so I regularly use technology with with students in a way that they they can access resources and and gain knowledge and I think that's important Um, we we grew up with things like YouTube and Instagram and Spotify and there are great resources on those platforms as well for students that are maybe a little more inexpensive and I think that's really important. I will say some a couple specific maybe more traditional things that that I've been thinking about a lot and that I recommend students is um, my former teacher Deborah Rickmeyer just came out with the Rickmeyer method and I know that's something that I'm just starting to digest uh, a lot of the a lot of the concepts in those two volumes i i've 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 worked with her on and heard her speak about in a lesson setting, but to have all of that written out and such great narrative I, I draw from I've been drawing from that a lot with students and they seem to really enjoy that and then something I've been working on with with Hal Leonard is trying to find a way to make publications through Leduc a little more inexpensive for students. Sometimes those publications coming from France are really expensive. So I've done a couple compilations of French literature, um, kind of of similar ability levels that are all in one kind of compilation. Um, So students can purchase purchase that at a lower price point and start to build their repertoire um, if that's the area in which they're studying. So um, a lot of different areas that I draw for, and I don't think one one student has the same journey, which is, I think, what's really special about working with students. Um, and so, yeah, I think the technology aspect is really important. Regularly in lessons, I'll be with students and I'll say, you need to check out this video on Instagram that I just watched. You'll find it really inspirational. And I think that, that it's going to click for you. Um, that's that's something I've said more than once in a lesson. Um, and I think resources aren't just kind of tangible and something you can hold 
bringing in a guest artist or going to a live performance is really, really valuable in that way as well. I think that's a big benefit of conferences is hearing live performances of, of individuals you maybe look up to or going to a jam session. I mean, you learn a lot from a jam session. If you're thinking about uh, the, the act of improvising and, and things of that nature. So uh, drawing from a lot of different things and my students read a lot. I teach an entrepreneurship class and we read Angela Miles Beeching's book, Beyond Talent, which is really great. Uh, we use resources from the profitable artists through Artspire. So working on a lot of different areas beyond what we're just doing in the practice room. And those are resources that are going to take us into a lot of different fields. That's a great answer. And honestly, like that's even better than what I had in mind because I think the we're just drawn to think about uh, method books like, you know, the Fairling and the uh, um, Liqueur etude books, etc. And I like that you brought up, you know, I actually have that book sitting on my shelf, the Miles Beeching um, uh, Beyond Talent. Awesome. Um, and I have some like resources on like injury prevention and uh, learning, et cetera. And, you know, I think no matter what, if you're a saxophone student, if you're studying concert saxophone, classical saxophone, whatever you want to call it, your teacher is probably going to say, like, have you looked at the Fairling book? OK, if you've done that, let's do the liqueur book or what, whatever they're going to give you. Um, and I, you're right, like that's going to happen anyway. That's just kind of part of you're going to be playing music written music in a practice room so it's like how can we expand on that and i like that you mentioned instagram and youtube because those are those are great resources for listening that don't come at a price personally i get a, a lot of use out of spotify and they offer a student discount and it's not very much it's like four dollars a month i think with an added hulu account or something and it's like that's a great resource if you would just want to go listen to anything i mean their their database is huge so like any classical saxophone recording you could think of probably will find on spotify or youtube so right. and 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 those are just those don't come at the same prices like and that, that's interesting that you brought up too uh, the leduc publications like i remember buying my first copy of glazanov when i was like a freshman in high school and it was like 50 dollars. yeah I bought it from the store yeah. You know, and it was like, it was like, whoa, is this going to happen every time I want to buy right. like, a, you know, a concerto or whatever. And, and the point of the compilations too, which is nice is I found when I was, I think we've all kind of fallen into this at some point in our lives is the sharing of sharing of music and copying and scanning and sharing PDFs. But we need to be continuing to support composers and artists and, and buying their music. So the point of this compilation and, and hopefully things like this continues, we also start to build our own library of music and, and continuing to support artists. Um, and that's, that's really important. I always encourage students to make sure you're buying if, especially if you're playing a new piece of repertoire, make sure you're buying it and you're not just sharing it around. We need to be supporting artists so that we're sustaining. Right. I, I'm pretty stingy about I don't play or work on solo music that I don't physically own a copy of. Um, and I, I do appreciate though when composers offer a, a PDF purchase option. Yeah. It's usually cheaper and it's easier because I know it's going to go to my iPad either way. Absolutely. So, I'll um, give a little I'll give one little plug for a, a, com uh, a company that I actually uh, am a part of called Elysian Publications. Um, it's a, an online only publishing company and some of my saxophone arrangements are on there and it's me and three three percussionists uh, and we do a, all PDF only things are about 15 to 20 dollars and you just immediately download and that's the whole point of that company is that so performers have easy access to music and we're also supporting composers it's all mostly new music or arrangements of more traditional pieces but um yeah i completely agree with you that's that's great so my second question and this is kind of a vague question but um we'll see where it goes what personal qualities do you look for in collaborators and why? Oh, well, I am a people person. Music to me is all about connecting with other people. And so I look for people that I, th 
I know I can get along with, that I'm going to have a connection with, and that I'm, I'm going to know that it's easy to communicate with. Because it's not just the act of playing together, but it's the act of talking. I think that's what we learn, we learn from in chamber music. Number one is communication. So for me, it's, it's the person and also that they have a strong musical capability on their instrument, but that's almost a given. Um, once you get to a certain level, it's, it's the person to me and that's, that's really important. I also look for maybe a quality of their music making that I strive to, to be better at. Uh, I know something that, that I've been doing a lot more of is free improvisation and less traditional notation. And so I do a lot of listening to, to performers who live in that space all the time. And so I try really hard to collaborate with those, with those musicians. Um, also someone I look up to in, in terms of a career and a, and a, and a life. And that's, that's really, the, those are the situations I thrive in. And to me, then when that's all set, that's art and creativity at its core for me. And that's where my heart is, is that, col that collaborating with artists that I both look up to, that I, I guess, mesh with, you could say, or I, I can have a conversation with outside of the art we're creating too. And, and that's really, that's really important to me. So it's kind of beyond just the artistic aspect, but the, the, the communication and the friendships that we'll make when I specifically, when I think about collaborating with a composer, which I do a lot of, especially these days is someone that is going to be open to maybe my interpretation of a piece or my, my musical background, but also um, it goes the other way as well. And so uh, that that is really important in terms in terms of that composer performer collaboration, which I think is just so special, especially as a saxophonist, we get to live in that space quite a bit because our repertoire is so new and it's changing a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I think as as performers, it's kind of you need to be on the same page with the other person in non-musical aspects because otherwise the the thing that you're trying to do might not happen you know like yeah. if you're not if if you don't vibe together if you don't um you know communicate well it's going to be pretty difficult to create a genuine artistic experience you know so yeah yeah and these are people that you might spend a lot of time with if you think about a collaborator in terms of a chamber group well all of the chamber groups i've I've spent time playing and we spend a lot of time together, whether it's traveling on the road, staying in hotels or Airbnbs together, sitting on Zoom calls. So um, you have to also want to spend time with these people. So um, being able to communicate effectively and have fun. I mean, you play in a chamber group and you probably know it's equally as important to just hang out and have fun. Right, the absolutely. Put the instruments down and and talk about other other aspects of our lives. That's that is so so important, and I think that's why my chamber music colleagues are some of my best friends, uh, which I think a lot of people, a lot of listeners can relate to. Yeah, I think anybody who knows me knows that you know the the three other people in my quartet are my three best friends. So oh, that's so cool. Like I mean, you know, it's kind of how I spend the most time with them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I see them every day, literally. And it, yeah, and, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And I think that's why it, it works so well. We, we get along on top of, you know, playing well with each other. Yeah. Which in yeah. some ways is, is more important. Yeah. And these are the people that, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm a little more far removed than you because I'm not in school anymore. But these chamber groups we form sometimes in school, sometimes not. These are people later in life that you might be in their wedding or see them have a child or they go through a big career change. And that is so exciting. And so that that makes it so much more fulfilling as a player, I've found. Uh, and then you'll be in new chamber groups and you'll make new connections. I've spent the last four or five months playing in a new professional chamber group. And I've found I'm quickly starting to make these really great friendships and connections both musically and outside of music that I get to spend a lot of time with and travel with and uh, 
study maybe a new art form or be in new spaces and that's really exciting in terms of that collaborative process yeah absolutely the third question that i have the third saxophone related question is are there any methods or routines that you use to practice sight reading if so what are they so i have some formal and maybe more informal techniques I've used to practice sight reading and I work on with students. Uh, the more formal way in which I practice sight reading and I, I work on a lot with students in lessons when we take time in lessons to do this is we'll use specific sight reading texts targeted to practice sight reading. Guy Lacour has a has a great two volume 100 sight reading etudes that if you haven't checked out I would they're in these little books and it's more kind of jazz notation, so they're also more difficult to read. And they're great. They start from the very basic beginning, half notes and whole notes, all the way to mixed meter, atonal, jumping all over the horn. And they're great for really young students all the way to more advanced students that might be preparing for, like, say, a military band audition. So those are great. When I was young, I also used to just go into music shops and buy etude books that I had never seen before that were maybe 10% below my ability level at that time and I would just go through one a day and I wouldn't try to be a perfectionist I would just really try and get through the sight reading process of giving myself 30 seconds to look at something read it down do it one more time move on and that process was really really um, important for me in the in the sight reading kind of journey and something I always tell students is pulse and rhythm are, are, are more important than getting every single note perfectly because the reality of you actually being able to sight read something perfectly is pretty slim. Being, being able to have good time, understanding the rhythm uh, is really important to me and is sight reading at its core. Uh, the more informal way I really encourage students to go through is to just try and sit in a big band as much as you can. There's the, the act of sitting in a big band for like a two or three hour set and sight reading everything. You learn a lot about your playing. <laughs> and uh, I think jazz musicians, especially in these great big bands, are amazing sight readers. Because to be able to turn around a program week by week, you have to be a great sight reader. So I always recommend students, we, we have a lot of really great local big bands in Milwaukee. And I always recommend to students like get on the sub list or like be that next call. So you get a chance to just sit in a big band and I'll talk to them like a week later and they'll say, oh my gosh, wow, I learned a lot about my sight reading. I had a lot of practice sight reading that night. Um, so I, I think being able to put yourself in maybe a vulnerable situation um, and and you, you learn a lot about yourself as a player and it's a great way to practice your sight reading that I think in some ways you learn a lot more than just kind of flipping through these traditional books uh, so that's really important is to kind of like correct yourself on the fly uh, so that that's something that really helped me when I was a younger player I did I played a lot of jazz in my undergrad that's where a lot of my formal jazz training came from and so I think that's important. Or if you have, you know, someone in your studio that's a little more advanced, sight read duets with them. See if you can find a weekly time to just sit down and sight read some duets. That's really important for kind of the, the learning process. Yeah, I'm so I, I'm minoring in jazz studies at MSU and I was in one of the big bands last year and my sight reading had just I mean, night and day improved last year. It was crazy. Yeah. And my, my technique teacher happened to be the lead alto in that big band. And I was second tenor. So we were sitting next to each other all year. So oh, I was awesome. constantly sight reading in front of my technique teacher, which kind of ah. like upped the, the level of pressure. So yeah. my sight reading really, really improved a lot, which was nice. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question that I always ask that for whatever reason isn't on this this rubric but this this is like my favorite question so how do you strike the balance between encouragement and criticism in your teaching hmm. well that's a good question for me i always my default and i think this is really important to who i am as as a player and a teacher is to make sure that the student feels like i am their mentor and i am i am 
kind of there to cheer them on. And so that balance is really important to me. And I think a lot of it has to do with language and how we might present something to a student. And instead of saying, you did this wrong, you need to fix this. It's more of, here are some ways that might help you fix this in the practice room. And I think that's important because 90% of our development and our, um, yeah, our development is gonna happen in the practice room. It's not that 10% that's gonna happen in the lesson. So if you think about it, you're in a lesson one hour a week. When you're, you're in the practice room, hopefully a lot more than that. <laughs> um, and so it, it's important to set a tone of encouragement in the lesson so that student is really inspired in the practice room to improve, improve, improve. And I think about that a lot so that students don't get discouraged in a lesson when maybe something didn't go as well and saying, well, that's homework. And, and I guarantee if you think about this a little bit differently, try some of these ideas, it's going to you're going to find that there's some improvement throughout the week. And that's really important for me. That just goes to my kind of background in educating and mentoring. I I grew up in a household of, of educators. My, uh, and, and working with students of different ability levels. My dad worked with students with disabilities. My mom was in the field of music therapy and then in public education. So educating and mentoring was just kind of a common conversation even if it wasn't my sibling and i adding to the conversation it was th these things were being talked about so i thought about that a lot and i i want the student to know that i'm i'm on their side and i'm i'm there for them and that's important so that that's really so yes i i i try to find in, in the student what I think is really going to help them and encourage them and give them tools to take into the practice room to improve upon that. So yes, it is criticism, but it's more of kind of adding to their toolbox they carry around to their different classes and their different fields that they'll go into when they leave, they leave their time studying with me. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in my experience as a student, just sort of building off what you said. I, I think um, I'm most productive when rather than coming into a lesson, playing my piece, and then, you know, hearing all the like, I, I, I don't think I've had a lot of instruction, maybe since early high school, where it's like, oh, you missed this, you missed that, you missed this. It's more like, you know, it's more specific than that. They'll say if there's, there's something that you are not doing, they'll call your attention to it, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, an idea. It's not like a, a right or wrong. Yeah. Um, and I can take all that into the practice room and, and sort of build off of these ideas. Um, cause I think a lot of times if you've prepared a piece, it's, and, and brought it to a lesson, it's not really as simple as missing notes anymore. Cause mm -hmm. if you prepared the, I mean, it happens, I'll go into a lesson and play a piece. I'm like, well, I need to go back because I didn't prepare that properly, but We've a lot of times, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean that sure like missing notes happens in lessons, but I think a lot of times if you've really prepared a piece that you're enjoying, like it's not, you'll miss a note here and there, but it's, it's most of the time it's been about ideas. Like, mm -hmm. you know, usually with me, I think dynamics is a big thing. Just mm -hmm. like you, know, you can always do more and you always yeah. should try and do more. Because mm -hmm. I think in the practice room, sometimes we get into sort of a mezzo forte mood. Mm -hmm. And like I, at least with me, I'm focused on notes sometimes. And I just yeah. am like playing at my nice, pretty mezzo forte, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, um, because I'm not thinking about any of that. Right. We don't want to break our pretty, quote, pretty sound or what the definition yeah. of pretty is to us. Yeah. Right. And I think back to some of the greatest lessons that I had as a student. And some of them, I didn't even have a saxophone in my hand. <laughs> they were just conversations about artistry and maybe a direction I was heading artistically or I felt like I hit a wall. And so those conversations were just as important as me going through my etude freshman year of, of college. And I do think some students need more criticism than others. I think that's just how we function as people. A conversation I have with students a lot is I'm very type A, I'm very extroverted, I, I learn a very certain way, 
there's other students that are not like that. And I've uh, learned a lot over the years that some students need more of that, just a little bit that more, more of that organization and the more directiveness uh, and others it's it's very different so I think it depends on really what the student needs and what's interesting about teaching college students because I teach students of a variety of different ages from some days I might teach a student who's eight all the way to 80 um, but it, sp specifically when you enter college you're going through some pretty big life changes it might be your first time away from home um, it might be the first time you are playing with other players who are better than you and so that is a re that's really interesting so those conversations I, I i regularly have with students and and just figuring out what they need in 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 the lesson there's there's that one hour time that uh that we have together and what's going to help them grow the most and so that's really important yeah great answer I, um now now i have more just like general non saxophone questions oh um so the first question is what do you like to do outside of music hmm i really i really enjoy watching sports a lot of different sports i think that's because when i was younger i was involved in sports and then I gravitated more towards music and that kind of went away. Um, but I've always thought there's a really interesting connection to being a musician and being an athlete. The act of practicing or being in training, performing, uh, being on a stage. I think they're really interestingly connected. Injury prevention, um, a lot of athletes use sports psychs. I think it's just very similar. So I think that's why I, I gravitate towards sports a lot. I also think it's a good way to kind of decompress and get away from um, what we do for many hours a day. It gives you maybe a team to be passionate about. Um, so I'm a really big soccer fan. If anyone knows me really well, they know I'm really into soccer, specifically women's soccer. I have for many years because I think specifically in women's soccer, they do a really good job at using their platform for so much more than just playing a sport. And I try to do that in my own career, is using my platform for so much more than just playing the saxophone. And so they, they do a lot for fighting for equal pay for women's athletes, which I think is really important. So that's a big area of interest for me outside of music. I'm also pretty into running and hiking. My mom is a really great runner she used to be like on ultra marathon running teams and would do ragnar and these big hundred mile races and so i try to run i'm not as good of a runner as she is um i really love running because it's a really good way to just shut off from maybe a project you're working on that you need to step away from and just get some fresh air uh i also think on the flip side it's a great way to plan for a project. Sometimes I plan out my practice sessions while running for the day or a lesson plan or like talk through a piece I'm working on. And so in a lot of different ways, I can kind of pick and choose what I think about on a run, which is great. Uh, it's also good for your body. Uh, so, and, and hiking, I have a dog that loves hiking. So we take her on hike on hikes a lot. And since I travel so much for music, uh, that is a really good excuse to kind of explore the town I'm in. So I, I really enjoy that in, in a lot of ways. So yeah, those, those are some, some current passions and it might change in a couple years, depending on where I'm at or what I'm doing. But those are kind of been the constants, constant kind of things in my life outside of music. That's awesome. Yeah. We have a, a little dog, so I don't know how much he'd like hiking, but he loves walking. So he kind of, oh. he needs at least one like 45 minute walk a day. Oh, we yeah. take him around the city of Lansing and that's oh. about, that's about his energy level. And then, okay. Yeah. yeah. Little dogs can't go as far. We have a right. medium sized dog and we actually have a running leash and we'll take her on oh. like three, three and a half mile runs. That's like her max. Um, 
but she lo- she loves it too. I think in a lot of ways she thinks it's a squirrel hunt and not just a run. Um, so she gets a little bit more out of it, but uh, she she loves it. So it's a really great. We have a lot of great running trails in Milwaukee. Believe it or not, even though it's Wisconsin, there are some running trails. They're not very hilly, um, but it's a good way to kind of run down to the lake and and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how if this was the best idea, but I used to take my dog for rollerblades instead of walks. Oh. I would rollerblade, and he has long legs for his size. And when he was younger, like maybe two and a half, three, like he had so much energy. And oh, okay. so I would put on my rollerblades and just pick up That's his leash, idea. and 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 he would he would like stay ahead of me and I would just go slow ish and like, wow. yeah. Uh, but now I don't know how much he'd like that, but what kind of dog is he? He is a kind of crazy mixed breed. He's Shih Tzu, Cocker Spaniel and Yorkie mainly. So oh, wow. he's like around 25 pounds. He's colored pretty much exactly like a Yorkie. Um, and he has the big paws and long legs. His hair, especially on his head is like fluffier like a shih tzu yeah and yeah yeah he's he's an interesting little mixed breed he sounds adorable yeah so what kind of dog do you have i have a blue healer she's a mixed blue healer we don't exactly know how much of each breed is in her but for sure blue healer or australian cattle dog um and maybe a little bit of mini doberman pincher and she has a spotted tongue so she could have chow chow in her too That's what people tell us. Um, But yeah, she's like 38 pounds. We we adopted her uh, from one of the local Wisconsin shelters. And um, she was from Texas and and found during a hurricane. And so so when when one of the bigger hurricanes went through Texas, um, they brought a lot of the animals over to the Midwest when they were found and so she um we we like to say she has a southern accent (laughs) that's funny (laughs) she's from texas but yeah we've had her for a little over two years now and i have a cat named jimmy who i adopted when i lived in rochester new york when i was going to school at eastman so he's a new york he's an upstate an upstate cat um who is more used to the cold weather that's awesome. Yeah, we have two cats. They're Sergeant Pepper and Penny Lane are their names. They're named after Beatles songs. And then nice. the dog is Corky. He's he was um at a shelter in West Virginia, a high kill shelter, and he was transported oh. to Cincinnati to a, you know, um a smaller shelter and we drove down to Cincinnati to adopt him and we've had oh. him since twenty eighteen. So Oh, okay. He's probably around six now. Okay. About. But yeah. Yeah, it's always cool connecting with people about their pets, I feel like. Oh, yeah. It's the best. And I always tell, I tell students this. One of the best decisions I made in grad school was to adopt a cat. Uh, It gave me more of a sense of purpose when I was going crazy. (laughs) Um, And it... Yeah, it it was just something that a lot of people around me said, you shouldn't get a cat, you don't have time for a cat. And I got one and it was one of the best decisions I made. So if you're ever kind of like on the fence, uh, in my experience, it was a really great decision and really important for me. And he's kind of gotten to go on a journey with me living in different cities and it, it was, it's great. That's great, yeah. No, I thought about that, I don't know. I don't know when I would get my own animal on my own but i thought maybe at some point in grad school would be a good time yeah Yeah. and i mean cats are so low maintenance yes yeah so a dog i probably wouldn't have gotten a dog in in grad school maybe i don't know but uh you can leave a cat for like a weekend and he's fine but uh yeah so it was it was great i always recommend it well uh thank you so much for for doing this i think that covers my questions uh i'm really excited to get this episode out there and um yeah yeah. thanks for having me it was great of course yeah yeah thank you for listening this concludes episode eight of the well-rounded saxophonist featuring special guest dr nikki roman professor of saxophone at the university of wisconsin milwaukee the music you heard in this episode was composed by dorothy chang performed by zachary costello alto saxophone and guillaume ra piano 
Thank you for listening, and remember to practice smart and stay healthy.